I'll give you, I'll let you test the screen share first and then um, if you can stop sharing screen. recording here for we can post this to YouTube afterwards. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter, GMU Observatory. You can find out more information about the observatory at science.gmu.edu slash observatory. And if you have any questions uh, tonight, feel free to post them in the chat uh, or um, reach out to us via email at gmuobservatory at gmail.com. So I'm Dr. Peter Plafchan, and we have these events on alternating Wednesday evenings. Our next event will be March 31st, so not two weeks from tonight, but four weeks from tonight. Our speaker will be Dr. David Kipping from Columbia University. Uh, we're not having an event in two weeks on March 17th because we actually have a Smithsonian Associates lecture with Dr. Michael Summers on the future of humanity in space. And so if you'd like more information on that event, uh, you can find it on our website. And these public events, are normally held in person, and we look forward to being able to welcome all of you back to campus, hopefully sometime next fall. Uh, and you can see on the right on the slideshow here that we have some pictures of our observatory and, and what our uh, lecture hall normally looks like uh, in the before times, but we hope you're all healthy and safe. We're located on the Fairfax campus atop research hall at George Mason University. And shown here in the middle of the inside of these pictures is the location of our control room and the classic dome structure you see on the left. And we're gonna be showing you live views tonight from our control room. We actually have humans there in person tonight. The weather is great. And we are going to uh, show you our views of the universe digitally and virtually tonight. Shown around in the perimeter, are some of the images that have been taken by students with uh, this facility here in Virginia. Uh, to stay up to date on our events, to read about space news and uh, celestial events, feel free to sign up for our newsletter, The Moon. Uh, again, uh, the link to sign up is on our website and we'll paste the link later in the chat uh, during our speaker's talk tonight. We also have a patrons of the observatory program. Uh, so if you are interested in your tax deductible donation would provide critical support for the observatory activities as well as for curious students seeking to explore our universe. We have different membership levels and I'd like to thank our existing Big Bang, Galaxy, Supernova, Nova, Cluster and Star members. As I said, I'm the director. We're joined tonight uh, who's in the control room, Dr. Rob Parks, our deputy director. Our graduate student, William Masco, is also in the control room tonight. And we have uh, Kevin Collins is also our observatory graduate teaching assistant. He can't join us. If you're a student here at Mesa, we have a student club called Friends of the Observatory. It's free to join. And you can find more information on Mason 360. And uh, Brandon Iverson is the current president of Photo. And I'd like to thank our tour guides who give uh, tours to hundreds of students every semester, including some of the students online tonight. Uh, including Ryan, Patrick, Owen, Ashley, Victor, Andrew, Muhammad, and Aiden. So thanks for joining us tonight. We're happy to have you. And it's a great clear night tonight. It's now my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker from Penn State. His name is Dr. Jason Wright. He got his undergraduate degree from Boston University and then went on to earn his PhD from Berkeley. And he's now a professor at uh, at Penn State, and uh, he's going to be talking to us tonight about new frontiers in SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, a very exciting topic uh, to be uh, doing research on. And one of our preeminent global experts on the subject is really, a, I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, uh, Jason talk to us. Now, um, during the talk, if you have questions, please remain muted. And you can post your questions in the chat and we will either answer the questions in the chat or we will um, ask the questions at the end of tonight's um, talk and presentation. At the conclusion of the question and answer session, we will have a tour of our observatory at that time via webcams and virtual views of our night sky live. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Wright. Welcome to Mason's Virtual Evening Under the Stars. Muted. Thank you very much, Peter. I'm really uh, glad to be here. So I will share this and we can get started. So yeah, I'm going to be talking about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, 
Um, it's something I've been uh, working on more and more over the past several years. Uh, and it is indeed a really cool topic and a lot of fun to um, uh, a lot of fun to work on. So um, I'm going to start by pointing out that it's a very old question, whether we're alone in the universe. Um, it, uh, one of my favorite quotes goes back to Albert the Great, one of the doctors of the Catholic Church who asked in one of his writings, do there exist many worlds or is there but a single world? This is one of the most noble and exalted questions in the study of nature. And those of us who look for planets around other stars, which is where my training is, uh, or life elsewhere in the universe, love this quote because it makes us feel uh, very important. Uh, he was actually talking about things like angels on the head of a pin and things like that. But that's okay, it still makes us feel important. And you'll tell me if these slides are not amazing. Um, a little bit later, whoop, come on. They were not amazing. Just a second. There we go. Um, a little bit later, uh, Giordano Bruno uh, asserted without any kind of evidence at all, he just liked to cause trouble. Uh, he asserted there are countless suns and countless Earths all rotating around their suns in exactly the same way as the seven planets of our system. And in this, he was absolutely correct. He was talking about Copernican model of the universe, but also saying, extending that to the other stars in the sky. We see only the suns, he continues, because they are the largest bodies and are luminous, but their planets remain invisible to us because they are smaller and non-luminous. And this is exactly correct. Um, the countless worlds in the universe are no worse and no less inhabited than our Earth. So this is called the plurality of worlds heresy. And for his troubles, uh, Bruno was burned at the stake by um, the Inquisition. Um, more recently, people have seriously considered in more scientific grounds that we might uh, have life elsewhere in the universe to, that uh, could interact with. Percival Lowell was a sort of self-made astronomer. He founded Lowell Observatory. And if you ever go to the Grand Canyon, you should stop by Flagstaff and visit Lowell Observatory. Um, and uh, he became famous, among other things, for charting the canals of Mars. So he would look through the telescopes at the observatory that he built, and he would um, make maps of the canals that he believed were carrying water from the poles of Mars to the other parts of Mars to feed big cities. Um, we don't really know what he was seeing through his telescope, but he convinced himself that that's what he was seeing. And for a long time, in fact, until the 60s, when the Mariner probes mapped the surface for the first time, um, it was an open question about whether Mars had life and whether it might have canals and water and things like that. And in fact, the maps he made were part of the charts that NASA used to guide what the Mariner missions might see. So if there is life out there, um, one of the reasons that's interesting is we think, hey, maybe we can interact with it, maybe we can communicate with it. Uh, and so there have been a bunch of old ideas about how such a thing might happen. One story, perhaps apocryphal, is attributed to Carl Friedrich Gauss, who was a famous mathematician. Uh, and uh, his idea was that we should use mathematics to communicate with, uh, with other beings, perhaps on Mars. Uh, and so um, the idea was that we should use geometric shapes. And if we could make big enough geometric shapes that illustrated some principle of mathematics, that that would reveal to beings on other planets looking at the Earth with telescopes uh, that we were intelligent and that we were here. Of course, you would need very large, very large squares. And so what he imagined is that you would cut down and plant trees in a configuration like this on a scale large enough that you could actually see them from another planet like Mars. So he proposed, uh, the story goes, doing this in Siberia. Uh, so you would just drop down, cut down the trees, plant new ones, and make a nice right triangle to prove that you know the Pythagorean theorem to the Martians. Uh, another idea that sometimes gets batted around is attributed to Joseph von Littrow. Uh, he uh, felt that uh, you know cutting down trees is nice and all, but maybe what we really need is a gigantic ring of fire. And then if you had a huge ring of fire, something like 30 kilometers across, that uh, that could, couldn't possibly be natural. And that would have to be something that would let them know that we were here. So that's another interesting idea. Uh, my favorite and most ridiculous idea from this sort of historical trove of these uh, is attributed to Charles Crow. OK, I'm sorry, that's not Charles Crow. That is Cheryl Crow. This is Emil Hortensius Charles Crow. 
uh, he was quite a character. Uh, and his idea was that we should communicate with Mars by flashing light at them. So here's Earth and there's Mars and we should send big bright, you know, light signals. But the problem is how do you create that much light? So yeah, you can burn down trees, that's nice and all. But what he imagined is that you could use sunlight and then use a gigantic mirror and focus the sunlight on Mars, uh, like you might do on a hot day on the sidewalk or something like that. Um, this seems like a really bad idea of announcing our intentions by treating like ants under a magnifying glass, but that, um, that, was, that was his idea for how to get this done. So, you know, letting them know we're here is one thing, but could, is it possible that they could somehow send us messages or something like that? That wasn't really something people knew how, you know, you could possibly happen until we discovered how to do wireless communication with radio waves. And one of the leaders uh, in this idea uh, was one of the people that developed the technology to do radio waves through space, who's Nikola Tesla. Okay, I'm sorry, this isn't actually Nikola Tesla. People might recognize this is actually David Bowie playing Nikola Tesla. This is Nikola Tesla. And so that's actually, you know, they did a pretty good job of the makeup, I think. Um, Nikola Tesla, um, was uh, a brilliant inventor that founded much of modern elect um, electricity and, 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 and um, everything that we do with, with electricity today. This is an actual photograph of him in his laboratory in Colorado uh, with what's now known as a Tesla coil. Um, and uh, these things are really loud, but there he is sitting very patiently, absolutely still while the photographer makes this incredible image. So one of the things he noticed is that if he set off sparks like this, his equipment could detect it very far away. Uh, and so this was, this was how um, telegraphy was invented. And he would monitor these signals. And he felt that sometimes the needle would wiggle even when he wasn't doing anything. And he knew no one had a, um, a, a system like his powerful enough to have made the needle wiggle. And he believed that he might have been noticing a similar set of equipment on Mars. Uh, and he even had this announcement. He was very pleased with this idea. Um, and it's a little ambiguous here whether he's claiming that he talked with the Martians or received their signals or just opening people's mind to the possibility. Um, but uh, he has observed electrical actions which have appeared inexplicable, faint and uncertain though they were. And they have given me a deep conviction and foreknowledge knowledge so it's, you know he's not saying it really happened that ere long soon all human beings on this globe as one will turn the eyes to the firmament above with feelings of love and reverence thrilled by the glad news brethren we have a message from another world unknown and remote it reads one two three and i guess that's the mathematics you know one two three would be a mathematical sequence proving that they're intelligent so you know we get really excited when we think we might find this stuff and answer those old questions uh, that Albert the Great had. So let me now turn to the way that we've practiced this today, uh, which isn't all that far from what Nikola Tesla did. If I asked you to, um, the first thing that comes to your mind, if I talk about SETI, radio signals from space, um, depending on whether you've seen it or not, the first image that comes into many people's mind uh, is this, Jodie Foster with the headphones at the very large array, from the film Contacts, which is based on a novel by Carl Sagan. Um, that book and that movie are extremely accurate when it comes to how radio astronomy is done. Um, the part where uh, L.A. Arroway actually contacts alien life, of course, that hasn't happened. And there's a few other things like you don't listen to radio waves on headphones and you definitely, definitely don't have a wire, a Wi-Fi signal on a laptop right next to the dishes at the BLA, but it made for a nice scene. And overall, the movie is very good and you're worth watching if you haven't seen it. But it's based on um, a real search that's been going on off and on for 60 years. And it starts uh, in 1959 at Green Bank Observatory in West Virginia when a young astronomer named Frank Drake realized that the equipment he was using was sensitive enough to detect signals that we could generate. So this wasn't you know, Nikola Tesla with a very low sensitivity antenna, imagining gigantic Tesla coils on Mars. This was gigantic receivers that could actually detect things not from Mars, but from other stars. 
um, as powerful as the signals that those antennas could give off. So the fact that we could detect ourselves at interstellar distances really was eye-opening because, you know, alien life could have technology that's much grander than ours and more powerful than ours. And so who knows how far away it could be and we could still receive the signal. So for the next 20 years, he and a small group of um, radio astronomers followed this idea and convinced NASA that it should be part of its search for life in the universe. And so for 20 years or so, that's something that NASA pursued, actually not even that long. Um, and there, were, there was a problem called SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. But this was, by the time the 80s came around, deficit talk was the big thing in Congress. You had to prove that you were gonna bring down the budget deficit and you had to show that you were gonna cut wasteful spending. And what sounded more wasteful than looking for little green men? And so there was a, a big ballet who was awarded the, the, um, the Golden Fleece Award for fleecing the taxpayer on frivolous spending. Uh, and the program was briefly cut. They revived it, they called it Hermes, the High Resolution Microwave Survey. Um, but the, the, the temptation was too hard to resist for grandstanding senators. And once again, uh, in 1993, the program was cut just as it was about to begin its big, biggest project. And so since then, there's been basically no government funding. Um, NASA until very recently has not been involved in this and very little searching has happened. And what searching had happened uh, is thanks to the work of Jill Tarter and some others. Um, Jill Tarter uh, was part of that NASA SETI search and uh, worked to found the SETI Institute in Mountain View, California. Uh, and it was endowed uh, from funds from the estate of Barney Oliver. Barney Oliver was uh, one of the founders of Hewlett Packard. He designed a famous calculator. Some people listening to this might have used once. Um, and uh, he was also a SETI scientist and he wrote some important papers about radio SETI. Uh, and uh, when he passed the SETI Institute's endowment, uh, allowed them to continue the project, Project Phoenix, it was called, to look at the nearest stars and find signals. More recently, uh, Paul Allen, one of the co, the co founder of Microsoft, uh, made a, a second large gift to the SETI Institute and allowed the SETI Institute to begin construction of what's now known as the Allen Telescope Array, a much more sensitive uh, and dedicated piece of equipment that can search multiple stars at once uh, with a much wider range of frequencies to scan the skies with. And then, most recently, uh, the biggest game in town these days. Uh, are the breakthrough initiatives. This is Yuri Milner, uh, California internet billionaire who has uh, pledged a uh, hundred million dollars is the current number, but he said he's willing to keep doing this until it succeeds. Uh, there he is with Stephen Hawking and Frank Drake on the right and uh, uh, or Martin Reese. Um, uh, and this is the biggest SETI program yet. And the biggest part of it is in fact to use the radio telescopes back at Green Bank uh, to perform one of the most comprehensive searches in the sky for radio waves. So there are other ways to go looking for these things as well. Um, there's ideas that you can use lasers. There's been ideas that you should look for things in the solar system. But what I want to talk about tonight uh, is looking for Dyson spheres. So if you rewind the clock back to 1960, when Project Osmo that Frank Drake was doing was just getting going, uh, there was another project. Uh, Freeman Dyson was a polymath. He died very recently. Um, and one of the great physicists uh, of the 20th century. Um, in 1960, he published a paper pointing something interesting out about alien technologies. He was interested in how big they could get. He wondered, what are the limits? Like, let's say that they need energy and they've got their solar panels and they go to space, how much energy can they collect? And the only limit he could come up with was they could collect all of the light from their star. Nothing prohibits them from collecting that much light. There's enough material in the system to build solar panels. Um, building large structures in space is possible. He worked it all out. He could not find any reason that an energy hungry species could not, in principle, use up all of its star light. And so he said, well, that's the limit. I wonder if it's ever happened. And so how would you be able to tell? Um, and the answer is that energy is never used up. It's just uh, converted to a lower temperature. So what does that mean? 
when my computer right now and yours watching this is drawing electricity from the wall. And uh, if you had solar panels, for instance, it started out that energy as sunlight, nice warm sunlight, hits the solar panels, get converted to electricity, and then that electricity gets used to power your computer, but then it's not gone. When that energy has been used, most of it comes off of your computer as heat. And it does it to some degree by heating the air around it, um, but in, in space and to some degree in the room you're in, it comes off as infrared radiation. So if you had infrared goggles, you could look at your computer and you would see it glowing brightly as the CPU turns away so that you can listen to this talk. So if an alien civilization had done such a thing as surrounding a star with solar panels, um, you wouldn't really see the star. It would have almost no optical luminosity, you could say, but it would have, be a very bright infrared source. And this is just completely general. It doesn't matter what they're using the energy for. They could be building giant lasers. They could be sending off radio waves. They could just be using their computers to watch cat videos. Whatever they're doing, they've got to give the energy up after they've used it. And it has to come off as infrared radiation. And so uh, the implication then is that if you saw a star or didn't see a star, but you did see a lot of infrared radiation, much more than that star had any right to be giving off, that would mean something was around it. And that could be a sign of what today we call a Dyson sphere. So this has been in the popular um, uh, uh, imagination for a while. Maybe one of the most famous was a Star Trek episode, Next Generation, season four, episode, season six, episode four, called Relics. Um, and in there, this is the inside surface of the Dyson sphere uh, that the Enterprise explores. Uh, and it's just this gigantic sphere around the star. So the name is a little misleading. Something like this could not actually exist. It's actually physically impossible to build something like that. But of course, in Star Trek, you've got anti-gravity. I guess you can do whatever you want. I mean, all that water is sticking to the inside surface there. So I'm um, in reality, we would just be expecting a very scaled up version of what we have now which is things in space with solar panels. After all, all of our satellites, or almost all of them, all of our interplanetary missions, or almost all of them have solar panels, and that's how they get their light. So the more things we put up, the more solar panels we put up, and you know, very slowly, we'll block more and more of that light as we put more and more things in space, until eventually, who knows how much. It's all freely streaming out. We might as well take what we can. So you'll also sometimes see fanciful illustrations. I, you, know, you do a Google image search for Dyson Sphere. This is what you get. Um, I don't know what most of these things are supposed to be, but they look really cool. In the lower right, that's them, I guess, deconstructing the planet for all the materials to build this thing. But you know, these things don't have to be these gigantic construction projects that take generations to complete. Um, they could just be one more, uh, one more solar panel at a time uh, until you've used it all. So what would you look for? Well, you go and you look at a picture of the sky like this. And uh, you'd say, gee, I wonder if any of those stars have Dyson spheres around. And so you would then put on your infrared goggles. And here we'll do that. We'll put on our infrared goggles and look at what the Andromeda galaxy looks like with infrared goggles. And there we go. This is the heat coming off of that galaxy. So in this case, all those swirls of red that you're seeing, that's what we call dust, us astronomers. It's like very fine, uh, even finer than cigarette smoke. It's like soot. And it's the stuff that planets and us and everything that's not stars is made of. And stars have some of it in there too, but they're mostly hydrogen. And so when stars explode, they spew their guts into space and all of the stuff that's not hydrogen forms this dust. Uh, and so you get these clouds of it all throughout a galaxy like this one here. Um, but individual stars you see here are blue, they're not red. And that's because they don't have a lot of dust around in general. But if one of those dots was red instead of blue, we'd say, hey, why is that star giving off so much infrared radiation? So it's been very hard to look for these things, but that uh, all changed uh, five or six years ago when the uh, WISE satellite launched by NASA mapped the entire sky at these wavelengths allowing us to do that sort of a search. And so that's how I got involved. We had a, um, a uh, survey, which we call GHAT, for glimpsing heat from alien technologies. On the left is one of the satellites we could use called IRAS, and on the right 
is the one uh, where we get most of our data uh, called Ys. And in the background, you can see a map of what the Milky Way looks like at these wavelengths. So what we were looking for were red dots. And so we were looking for, well, we were looking for something like this. Here's a field and some of the dots are red and we can kind of look at why and how red, but right in the middle is just this deep red object of some kind. And that's basically what the Andromeda galaxy would look like if all the stars had Dyson spheres and it was really far away. And so actually when we saw this, where we were just like, oh my gosh, what am I looking at? We checked the catalogs, no one had ever noticed anything there before. So could it be that the WISE satellite had discovered what exactly what we were looking for and no one had ever noticed before because no one had had a satellite like that that could see it? It turns out now, this is actually a data artifact that had been left in the data, the processing pipeline had missed, um, but it illustrates the kind of thing we were looking for and also shows that our search would have found them if they existed because we found that. So spoiler alert, we did not find any aliens, uh, but we did find a lot of cool things. We found a star that everyone thought was going to be a red dot, and it turned out to be a blue dot. So this is a star you can see with, uh, with your eyes, uh, and it's called 48 Libre. In fact, uh, in a few months, it'll be up in the evening. Uh, and it turns out it's not a red dot, it's a blue dot with red stuff around it. And that, no one knew that before. So that's something that we discovered in the course of our, of our search. Uh, we also found something that, you know, kind of blew us away. Here's, here's the patch of sky we were studying. The red circle there, there's nothing in it because there's nothing there. This is a boring, empty patch of sky. But if we put on our infrared goggles, there's definitely something there. There's five or six, uh, maybe more, sources here giving off infrared radiation. So are they Dyson spheres? Probably not. We looked at the, the light they're giving off and it's not what you would expect for heat coming from dust or, 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 or not, not from a Dyson sphere. Anymore. Um, we're not really sure what it is. It's probably what we call an embedded star forming region. It's far away and uncatalogued, um, but it's pretty cool that uh, we stumbled across that. So we'll still keep looking. Um, we'll, uh, the, the data still have a lot to offer us and we'll keep trying to, to find some, but our initial survey was nothing obvious. It doesn't look like anyone's done anything like that. On the other hand, maybe it's too much to ask that any species would have used up 100% of its starlight. Maybe there's some out there that are only using 1% of their starlight, and we would not have noticed that yet. It will take a lot more work for us to get to the point where we can um, say that there aren't any doing that. But there's another way that we could go looking for these, which is instead of looking for the infrared radiation, we could look for that stuff passing in front of the star. And this is inspired by other work I do, which is looking for planets around other stars. The idea is that if a star has a planet going around it, and if that planet's orbit takes it in front of the star, which doesn't have to, most don't do that, but some will, um, then uh, when it goes in front, the star will get a little bit dimmer. And so here you see the way that we study this, we look at how bright the star is, and we just keep measuring its brightness, say every 30 minutes or something like that. And you know, stars don't change their brightness very much, and so it's nice and steady. And then it suddenly gets dimmer for a little while and gets brighter again. And if it does that, for instance, every 30 days, then it looks like there's a planet going around every 30 days and you could see what we call the transit as it goes in front. Now this is heavily exaggerated. Um, this is an extremely large planet going in front of the star in the picture. Really even a planet the size of Jupiter would only be one tenth of the size of the diameter of the star and so only block one percent of the light and so here it looks like it's like blocking a third of the light in the plot uh, but really it's an almost imperceptible dip it's very hard to measure uh, and that's why we launched the kepler space observatory to uh, make exactly those sorts of super precise measurements of stars not from through the earth's atmosphere where the stars are twinkling but from high above uh, where you can do that sort of thing and it searched over a hundred thousand stars looking for planets like Earth passing in front of their star. And planets like Earth are even smaller than Jupiter. You're looking for dips that are 1% of 1% of the star's normal brightness. It's extremely challenging. Anyway, 100,000 stars and discovered thousands of planets. It turns out planets are common in the galaxy. But an interesting question is, are we sure they're planets? 
because all we saw was the star get dimmer. How do we know it's a circular planet and not something else? How do we know, for instance, that it's not like a triangular solar panel? Not because aliens would build triangular solar panels, but just because it's not a circle. Could we tell the difference between a circle and some other shape, or even maybe some more complicated shape like this? And uh, the answer is maybe. Um, depending on how big that circle is, uh, you can tell based on subtleties in the shape that what's going in front isn't a circle. And the, the, the more strange this, this signal is, or the more strange the shape is, like this, for instance, the more obvious it is that you're not looking at a circle. So what would that look like? Instead of it having this characteristic shape here, it would have some other shape. It might be lopsided, or it might suddenly get dimmer and then brighter again. Or, you know, why would there be one? Maybe there's a lot of these things and you can just see them all over the place. Instead of showing up every 30 days, maybe they show up randomly. So, you know, that's something that Kepler could have noticed in its study. And it, Kepler is all done. We've done its big survey. So, of course, it didn't see any of those you would have heard about, right? Well, it turns out it's not that simple. The software NASA used to find the planets assumed that it was looking for things like this. And it ignored other weird shapes because stars can get brighter or dimmer for lots of reasons that aren't planets. And if you're just looking for planets, that's just noise, you wanna filter it out. But there was a team of citizen scientists, just everyday people who wanted to help out, who looked with their eyes, not a computer algorithm, at all of the light curves, that's what this is called, brightness versus time, all the light curves of all the 100,000 stars that Kepler stared at for four years, they went through every single light curve to see what it is that NASA might have missed. And what NASA missed was this. There is a star out there and it just kind of randomly gets dimmer. So the fuzz here is probably the rotation of the star. It's just something stars do, no big deal. But the wiggles up and down are real. It, it's changing in brightness. And you see it gets a lot dimmer, like almost 1% dimmer there at day 261. Um, and then it just gets brighter again. And that doesn't look like a circle going in front. Whatever that shape is, it's not a circle. Something went in front and then went in front again. And it looks like there are all kinds of stuff going in front. And that never happened again. Other things happened again. Here's something else that it did on day 1,206. It just, like, what is this shape? Is it a ringed planet? What, what are we looking at? It's really hard to understand. Most stars don't do anything like this. They're just flat. On day 794, it did something particularly strange. The scale here is different. You can't even see the wiggles anymore. You see how precise these measurements are. It started at normal brightness, and then over the course of a week, it got 1% dimmer, and then 2% dimmer, then three, then four, then five, then seven, all the way down to 16% dimmer. And then suddenly went back up. And after a little while, with some little wiggles went back to normal. That's not a circle. And whatever it is, that's huge. Remember, Earth makes a dip that's 1% of 1%. Jupiter would have made a dip that's 1%. That's one tick mark on the left-hand axis. This got 16% dimmer. Whatever blocked it is like the size of the star. So this was just mind-blowing and weird, and everyone was sure it was some kind of mistake. Then it did this. There are a lot of things passing in front of the star in this light curve. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, there's like 20 different things. They're all different sizes, they're all different shapes, they're all going in front of the star. I don't know what this is. So when this was discovered, um, the astronomer on duty, her name was, it is Tabitha Boyajian. She was a postdoc at Yale, uh, and she was tasked with solving this puzzle. And she happened to show me the light curves when she was trying to crack the puzzle. And she said, do you have any idea what this could be? And I said, well, I don't have any good ideas, but I have a weird idea. And I explained to her that this was actually something that had been predicted based on the idea that there could be Dyson spheres. So she published a paper and said it was probably not Dyson spheres. She didn't even mention that in her paper. She said it was probably a giant cloud of giant comets. And by comets, I don't mean those little things that go through the solar system, which if they hit the Earth would like be catastrophic. Uh, I mean gigantic things like the size of Pluto. 
that have enormous tails filled with dust and that's what's blocking the starlight. This is still, I think, the best um, explanation. It's hard to understand why it would happen, but it's plausible and everything we've studied since suggests that that's still probably the best explanation, but we still don't really know what it is. But she was intrigued enough by this idea that I got together with uh, her and the leader of the Breakthrough Listen team, remember Breakthrough Listen, Yuri Milner, and I said, can we use the Green Bank Telescope to check just in case this is a Dyson sphere, maybe they're giving off radio signals that we can detect. And so we teamed up with Andrew, Dr. Andrew Simeon at UC Berkeley, and we used, uh, we, well, we just put in a telescope proposal. We asked, can we use the telescope for this? And we wanted, you know, to, to check this star. And that's all we did. We just asked to use the telescope. We didn't tell anybody what we were doing other than the people that allocate time to the telescope. However, a reporter was talking um, to Andrew and to Tabby and me and, and trying to find interesting stories and um, had an interesting talk with Andrew about the Breakthrough This and Project and the Berkeley SETI Research Center. And he said, do you uh, have any really interesting targets that you're excited about? He said, oh yeah, there's this great star. Let me tell you about it. And that turned into this article for the Atlantic. This is a great article. Um, it's really cool, the most mysterious star in the galaxy, and it tells the whole story of how we found this thing. And when Ross interviewed me, I blurted out, it looked like the kind of thing you might expect an alien civilization to build. Because it is, uh, but when you kind of pluck it out like that and make it the pull quote, it gets people excited. And people got very, very excited. BuzzFeed News, have scientists really found an alien megastructure around a distant star? Hint, this is what's called Betridge's Law. If there is an article, and the title has a question mark at the end, the answer is no. Try it, it almost always works. Um, it got a lot of attention. Stephen Colbert got extremely excited about the whole thing and Neil deGrasse Tyson had to calm him down. It was pretty funny. Um, it was on Saturday Night Live Weekend Update where they made fun of the whole thing. Um, it, was, it, was, uh, it was a big deal. And I don't know if you heard about it or not, but I certainly heard about it. It was pretty embarrassing, actually, because I hadn't put out a paper. We hadn't done anything. We just asked to use the telescope. And yet uh, my colleagues, people I respect, were being asked, what do you think about this claim that Jason Wright has, that there's aliens around the star? And they had nothing to base it on. And so it got, um, uh, it got kind of embarrassing for a while. But we got through it. I learned a lot about dealing with the, the media. And of course, we eventually checked it. Here's the Allen Telescope Array. It studied the star, did not see anything. We did eventually get our time on the Green Bank Telescope, uh, and we studied it, and we did not see anything. We're actually working on that paper right now. We're going to publish that soon. And it led to this reflection by a lot of people about how we can present this to the public uh, without it just completely blowing up and the, uh, and the British tabloids running off with it. And it's a challenge because the public really wants to know about the search for life in the universe and not many people actually do it. And so as a result, everything we do seems to be newsworthy and people wanna write stories about it. And so we have to be careful to point out that we've barely done any searching. We're just trying to get going. We can't even get NASA to fund it. Um, and you know, we can only look at a few things here and there. There aren't many of us working on this problem. And so I think the public has this sense that NASA does this all the time, that that's what radio telescopes are for, that the search for life in the universe is a big part of, um, of federal, federally funded astronomy. And it's just, it's not true. We look for uh, microbes. There's a lot of interest in whether there's life on Mars, microbial life on Mars, perhaps in the plumes of Enceladus, we can send a mission to go sample that material and see if there's evidence of life in there. But when it comes to technological life, something that we might be able to signal, there's really hardly any work being done, um, except for the work at Breakthrough Listen, for instance, uh, by a handful of astronomers. And there's a few other projects. There's a laser SETI program, for instance, at UC San Diego, that I'm really excited about. So I've left you hanging. I haven't told you what Tabby Star was actually doing. Um, the, the, the star, which now is officially, by the way, called Boyajian Star. Not many stars are named after people, but astronomers officially call it Boyajian Star now, or you know, to uh, her friends in the media, Tabby Star. 
Um, it turns out that whatever is blocking the light from the star, it's our old friend dust. Remember dust, the stuff that gives off infrared radiation that's everywhere? Well, it turns out it's in comets. That's what makes comet tails so obvious is that the comets are actually made of a lot of that dust. And when they heat up uh, and they evaporate, they carry that dust out and that's what the tails are. And so Tabby's original idea, giant swarms of giant comets, predicted that it would be dust that's blocking the star. And what we were able to do, uh, Tabby and I and others, put the, all of this public interest to good use and Tabby started the Kickstarter. And we raised enough money to purchase telescope time on a private telescope network to monitor the star and try and catch it getting dimmer again, and we did. And what we were able to do is show that when it got dimmer, when something passed in front of it, it blocked more red light than blue light. And that's what dust does. And so the star would get, for instance, 2% dimmer at blue wavelengths. Um, but then when we put a red filter in front of the camera to take the pictures, it was only 1% dimmer. And that's not what you would expect from say solar panels. They should block all of the light and collect it all, not let the, the, the red light through. But that's exactly what dust does. Uh, for similar reasons to why the sky is blue during the day, blue light is scattered uh, more easily than red light. And so that means whatever it is is dust. Now, we don't actually know where the dust is. This is an artist's impression. We don't have pictures like this. It could be comets, maybe the dust isn't from comets, maybe it's around the star and other clumps for other weird reasons. Maybe it's between us and the star in the interstellar medium. We don't know where it is. We don't know why only this star behaves that way and no other stars seem to do it. Uh, but we do know it's dust and that was enough to kind of calm down the media and everyone says, all right, it's not aliens. We can all go back to work solving the mysteries of the universe. Um, there are other ways to go look at that I haven't talked about. I mentioned those lasers, another thing, you know, it's possible that if there's life out there, it could come visit us. Now that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, saucers on the White House lawn or whatever we're talking about. Maybe they're not even interested in us at all, but we send probes into the universe. Why wouldn't there be probes that come by and study our solar system or pass through for whatever reason? It's an old idea. It's actually older than the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. I mean, it, it happened before Frank Drake started Project Osma that such things might happen. And you may have heard about Oumuamua, our cigar-shaped visitor. Um, this is an artist's impression. We do not have pictures of this thing, uh, but something came into the solar system from outside it and it was big. It was like size, length of a football field, sort of big. And um, this is the first time we've seen a big object from outside the solar system pass through the solar system. And it must happen all the time. They're just so small that they're very hard to spot. But one was spotted um, and uh, it defied our expectations. We said, well, you know, there must be comets out there. It must happen all the time that comets get ejected from planetary systems and then pass through the solar system and we should see them occasionally. But they'll be small and rare and it'll be hard to spot them. Well, when this thing came through, we're like, we found it. It's an interstellar comet. Here it comes and it didn't have a tail. It wasn't a comet. Also, it was really long. We don't know exactly how long. This is probably an exaggeration in this picture here. It might have been more like a quarter instead of a cigar. Um, and it, even if it's a cigar, it's probably only half as long as you see here. But at any rate, it's not the sort of shape that we expected. We didn't have pictures of it, but we could tell the shape by how its brightness changed as it tumbled through the solar system. And then it did do something we expected. If it was a comet, we, we would expect the gases that come off of it to make it change its direction. And it did that, but we couldn't see the tail, which was confusing. Anyway, there was a lot of things that were anomalous and defied our expectations. And so there was some talk uh, that perhaps it was an alien probe, perhaps it wasn't actually a comet. Um, subsequently, a second one has come through from a totally different direction. Uh, and that one was a comet. It looked like a comet, it behaved like we expected. So what was going on with this thing? So um, its name is Oumuamua, it's from a Hawaiian word uh, that means something like the first scout or the scout that comes through or something like that, approximately. Um, and uh, it's caused a lot of people to study it and wonder, are we going to find more of these? It's a wonderful opportunity to understand interstellar space. 
Um, I don't think the idea that it's an alien spacecraft has much currency. It, it was anomalous in some ways, but not so much that we really need to go there. But it has gotten a lot of people thinking about how we might look for probes in the universe, or the solar system as well. And so the good news is that we don't have to do all of this without funding. Congress has changed its mind. The people that are in charge of deciding whether these kinds of projects should receive federal funding uh, are now saying to NASA, not how dare you study that stuff. They're saying, you're looking for all of this stuff. Why aren't you looking for intelligent life too? And so Congress has been sending signals, not bills that say thou shalt, but signals that say, this is okay. You should be studying it. And if you aren't, we might have to write a law that says you have to. And NASA turns out to respond to those sorts of incentives. This is one of the gentle ways that Congress can um, influence how the federal agencies work uh, without going through the trouble of passing bills in both houses and all of that stuff. So even though no law is requiring NASA to do it, NASA has definitely heard the message. <laughs> uh, and it turns out that they are uh, back. They are back in the business of um, looking for life in the universe. And so they took all the, um, they have uh, funding calls where they say how much, um, uh, 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 how much money that they're going to give astronomers that don't work for NASA to do certain things that are consistent with their research direction. So they'll say, we want people to study how old the universe is. Or we want people to explore habitability on planets. And uh, in those calls, they've said, but not if you're looking for technological life. And they've had that language in there for, for decades. And they took it all out. And now we're allowed to ask for money to look for life elsewhere in the universe in those calls. And they've actually approved of a few um, proposals to do that, which is uh, really great. And uh, I'm, I'm playing a small part in one of those. And so hopefully we can start doing this everywhere and um, make some progress on this. And one, um, uh, one good sign was that when, when Congress said, what are you gonna do if we were to give you all this money? NASA, NASA had no idea what it would do because it wasn't in that game. Um, and, uh, and so it held a workshop. And so this is all of us at the workshop. NASA asked me if I would organize this workshop. Uh, and so we have experts in SETI, we have people from NASA, people who study stars, uh, and we all got together and talked about all of the different ways that we could look for life in the universe. And it was a big success. We wrote a big report and we sort of said to the astronomical community, this is what SETI is and this is what NASA can do. And since then, uh, it's, it's been great watching the field grow, watching um, new students get trained in it. You can get trained in this at, at Penn State University uh, and, and turn it into a real academic discipline. So I'm hopeful for the future that this is a growing field and, uh, and that we might have our answers to uh, Robert the Great's question, uh, maybe in our lifetimes, who knows? We need to search if we're gonna find if the answer uh, is yes. And so we're finally doing that searching. But I do wanna point out that um, this isn't new what we're doing, it's just late. And uh, the pioneers of this field, Frank Drake, Jill Tarter upon whom the Jodie Foster character was based, Dan Wertheimer at Berkeley using these instruments, the Green Bank Telescope, uh, the most, one of the most sensitive radio telescopes uh, in the world, and our dear departed Arecibo in the upper right, where a lot of SETI work got done. Unfortunately, it recently collapsed, which is a real tragedy. Um, just so sad, but hopefully they'll be able to rebuild it bigger and better, and we'll be able to continue this search for life in the universe until we find something. So that's, uh, that's the search for life in the universe. And I'd be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Dr. Wright. Uh, let's give a virtual round of applause for our speaker. Uh, you can use the reaction button on your Zoom screen to have some virtual applause. That's a wonderful talk. So uh, we uh, will take questions now from our speaker and I have a lot I wanna ask. Uh, and we'll, uh, if you have a question, go ahead and post them in the chat. At the, as we get a little bit further along, if Dr. Wright's willing to stick around, we'll take more questions. And then we're gonna have our live telescope show. And the weather looks great and it looks like everything's all set up there. Okay, so uh, the first question came early in the talk. 
uh, from uh, someone on their phone, what are the chances that life truly exists elsewhere? My personal opinion is 100%. About me personally, but the person that was asking the question. Yes. Um, so my undergraduate advisor uh, said that there are only two numbers of things in the universe. There's zero and infinity. There's nothing in between. Nothing's unique in the universe. Uh, just because it's so big. Like any condition you can imagine, if you go far enough in an infinite universe, sooner or later, you'll see it again. So there's, there's, um, there's nothing new in the universe. So um, we're here. So we know it's not zero. So it must be infinite. There must be infinite life in the universe. Now, that doesn't mean it's nearby. It could be, you know, 200 trillion light years away, in which case we'll never, ever know. Um, so the, the real question is, how close is it? How common is it? If it's really common in the universe, maybe it's in our galactic backyard and it's, you know, only 100 light years away or something like that. And that's what we're hoping for. We're hoping that it's common enough that we'll be able to detect it. Uh, or if it's rare, that it's making so much noise. It's so bright. They're sending out such strong signals. They're using up so much of their starlight or something that we can notice them even if they're far away. Uh, but that's the test. We will look and look, and if we don't see anything, then we know it's rare. But we can never say it's not there because um, we can't prove it. We can't prove that negative. So um, I'm a fan of one of your uh, older papers where you did a search, and you might have mentioned this. I had to step away for a little bit, uh, where you searched for evidence of Kardashev type two civilizations. Or maybe type three, no, type three mm -hmm. civilizations. You're right. Yeah. Uh, in the um, in the local universe. Uh, yeah. And uh, when I read that paper, you you did have some conclusions in the end where you mentioned that there were candidates, but it was just too difficult to tell, given that yeah. there's all these other possible astrophysical explanations. Uh, and I, I forget when what year that paper was. Maybe it was 2014, 2012, around there. Um, Go ahead. And, uh, but uh, can you give us an overview of what that paper was about if you didn't during the talk yeah. and so uh, this tell was us what and any updates you may, might have? Yeah, this was the GHAT survey that I mentioned. And I, I said we didn't find anything, but you know, you're right. We did see some galaxies, whole galaxies that were giving off a lot of infrared radiation. And in every case that we're like, wow, what is all that infrared radiation coming from? Um, we discovered that it was a well-known, what's called a starburst galaxy. So this is a galaxy that's just filled with stars being formed. Those stars are lighting up all of that dust really bright in the infrared um, and making those, those galaxies extremely bright um, when you put on your infrared goggles. Uh, but there were, I don't know, I think four of them that were not listed as starburst galaxies. And so we're like, well, what are they? And no one had ever studied them before. So, the most natural explanation is we discovered four new starburst galaxies <laughs> because they look and you know if it looks like a duck and walks like a duck and so on. Um, that said, no one's ever studied them. So if we took a spectrum and it turned out that they didn't have all the characteristic features of star formation, that would be weird. And in fact, um, we did find some interesting weird galaxies with like a little too much infrared radiation, but they didn't have the corresponding ultraviolet that you expect from star formation, and that's a little weird. Um, and, uh, and so there's, you know, intriguing things that are almost certainly just natural anomalies. Um, but that's the whole thing. When you look at 100,000 things, you find some weird ones. Yeah, I think that was a really fascinating paper. And the fact of the matter is you did find some candidates and it'd be great. Uh, so, so has anyone Love followed them follow. up or, or is that something that's a work in progress? So, um, people have followed them up and uh, actually I said, um, yes. So um, I said, no one's gone to take a spectrum, but that's wrong. Mike Garrett um, pointed radio telescopes at them and say, oh, did they see radio signals? And the answer is yes, but actually that's expected because the radio signals they saw were not like FM radio. Or something. It was the, the, the broad spectrum radio that you expect from all of the ionized gas that you see around regions that are forming stars. And so that was totally expected if they are active in star formation. And so for the most part, he found that our best candidates had that strong radio emission. Um, but it was a statistical survey. It wasn't a, you know, one by one. So we didn't go through and say, that's a starburst, that's a starburst. So they still need more study. Oh, that's great. Um, so 
there's been a lot in the news recently about Oumuamua and a certain professor's book coming out about it. Oh, it's uh, out, I think. <laughs> it is out. Okay. Um, and you talked a little bit about the what you uh, said that you feel that it, uh, there are some interesting features about the uh, the interstellar visitor that we had. Um, and uh, I what can you expand a little bit about on your thoughts about that uh, in general about science communication about SETI in general oh. to the public and uh, kind of what what do we think we could do better? Uh, or, or not doing right, uh, pardon <laughs> sure. the pun, Dr. Wright. Yeah, so so this is the book. Avi sent me a copy. So I, I have a copy of Avi's book, which I've read. It's called uh, Extraterrestrial, The First Sign of Intelligent Life Beyond Earth. And the book, uh, it's, it's kind of half memoir about Avi and half a discussion about um, making the case that we should really seriously consider that Oumuamua was an alien spacecraft. And he goes through and he, he gives all the evidence. Um, and so in promoting the book, he's given a lot of talks where he's just basically made the strongest case he can um, that, it's, that it's an interstellar um, probe or, or, or a fragment of a probe or a piece of a light sail or something like that. Um, so this is a little different from how we often do science communication, uh, which is even when we're talking about our own work, uh, when we're talking to the public, we kind of, you know, take a step back and we, we, we just describe the science and our role in it and the cool things that we've learned. Um, but Avi has a case to make, you know, he really wants us to think um, and, and, and ask ourselves, why does that idea seem silly? And why, when astronomers hear, oh, maybe it's an alien spacecraft, do they have this reaction like, oh, stop it, it's just a comet. And he wants us to really open our minds and say, okay, how do we really know what's a comet? If it's anomalous, why are we so quick to dismiss that? And in that sense, um, I think that's that's great. I think we should keep very open minds about these sorts of things. Um, on the other hand, I think he's badly overstating the case. The evidence that it's anything other than a slightly weird comet um, is, uh, is very weak. And in fact, we do know of small comets uh, in the solar system a lot like it that are long like that, have similar brightness variations that um, don't have tails, but do have thrust that makes them move. Um, and there are also plausible models for other anomal sorts of things that could be that fit the data extremely well. So I think it comes down to your priors. If you don't have any prior belief about what it could be, then yeah, sure, you know, it could be an alien spacecraft. Um, but if you say we expect to see you know, chunks of nitrogen ice in space, we expect to see interstellar comets behave weird, then it fits into there as well. Um, and it's such a strong claim to say that it's, you know, it could be aliens. Uh, I think you need a lot more evidence uh, than is there. And so I know there's been a lot of friction between Avi and um, uh, the astronomical community about that approach. It's definitely not the approach I would take. Thanks for that very informative answer. So our, our next question uh, comes from a, a, another guest. Um, a couple of days ago, NASA published a picture about a, a hole on, on the surface of Mars. Uh, did you hear anything about that or, or, or no? Uh, anything news to me. News to me too. Um, so I, I think it, it, it is something to do with like a, a subsurface cave kind of thing opening up where kind of like, kind of like where you have the on Earth, you get sinkholes. Sinkhole? Yeah, I think it's a. It might be a sinkhole of some kind. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. NASA spots deep, strange hole on Mars. Uh, okay. The first hit was Mars is a hellhole, but yeah. <laughs> the second hit, the second hit, uh, it looks like lava tubes. Well, that's pretty cool. Um, oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Be so good. If, um, we have a lava tube underground that you know it you know flows out and then it's hollow and then if something collapses it you get a hole. So it looks like um, high rise spotted a uh, a sinkhole into a lava tube or something maybe. That'd be pretty cool. So I'm really excited to hear that you were chairing the new uh, NASA meeting that took place uh, in launching. Uh, a new funding initiative for yeah the NASA, NASA Techno Signatures Workshop. That was a lot of work, but it it, it went great. 
It was limited to about what, 50 participants or something like that? I think, yeah, we can only fit 50 people or so. I and think this was, was like, in the before times, before the pandemic hit. This was 2018 and we had to hastily assemble it in like three months. So we did a full on remote participation international conference with 50 people uh, from scratch in something like three months. Um, I think Don Gelino, uh, who's my co-organizer, nearly died, like literally from <laughs> getting it all together. But it went so well that um, the, uh, we really want to do it again. And so we're hoping to have an even bigger one at Penn State. And it's planned for last summer. So that didn't work. And so we postponed it till this summer. Still seems like a bad idea. <laughs> so in like 18 months, <laughs> we're finally going to do it. Not even, 16 months. We're finally going to have uh, the sequel which will be much bigger and better and we'll have a lot more time to plan. Great. Yeah, I thought about, I don't know why I chose not to attend. It was interesting. I was like, eh, maybe I'll attend. <laughs> I thought that was really neat. But you're, so you're saying there has been some pilot funding available for SETI from NASA recently? Yeah, people have submitted successful proposals. So actually the next symposium, um, the National Science Foundation has already agreed to support participant costs um, for that, which is wonderful. And um, yeah, so uh, Anne-Marie Cody has a proposal to look for um, strange light curves, I believe, mm. with Daniel Giles. And uh, Jean-Luc Margot at UCLA, uh, who does radio SETI, uh, has also won an award of some sort through XRP to uh, work on that. And then I am part of a grant through uh, Adam Frank at the University of Rochester with Jacob Pakmistra and Ravi Koparapu and others to um, uh, study whether we can find atmospheric techno signatures, meaning when we're studying the atmospheres of star of planets, um, you know, we're looking for biosignatures, we're looking for oxygen, we want to see methane. But you know, what if we saw CFCs? That can those those are all technological. There are no naturally occurring. CFCs for those in the audience, chlorofluorocarbons, the stuff that's kind of produced by uh, air conditioners, right? Uh, well, we use them for a lot of things. They're extremely a lot of, a lot of industrial chemicals. Production. They're completely inert. They're they're non toxic. They're they're very useful, except that they destroy the ozone. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, some of them do. Not very all useful, of them. except for that. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but they're all artificially produced. The the number the, the levels produced naturally are so small they don't matter. So if you know if you saw that, you would know you'd seen technology. And so we're exploring this idea just just trying to get our hands around it because no one's ever really done the math before to see if you saw a strange spectrum could you show it's technological yeah i think avi lobit actually mentioned that as well mm -hmm. in some of his uh, his uh, recent talks uh but there's also this factor that we have to worry about of course like that you know, we don't know what fraction of or, you know, Earth-like planet atmospheres we look at have any biosignatures of any kind, let alone techno signatures. So well, that's actually something that's come out of this. And uh, we just, uh, just uh, was it yesterday or earlier today, um, heard from Manasvi Lingam, uh, who's part of the group, uh, and actually I think co-wrote the paper you're talking about with Avi. Um, and uh, what we point out is you know CFCs have only been in our atmosphere for decades, and the Earth has been here for billions of years. So you think, okay, what are the chances you'd ever see it somewhere else? Someone staring at the Earth would have had to wait four billion years just to see it for a couple of decades. But um, but that's only looking you know at a planet we know didn't have techno signatures. You know who knows how much longer we'll have techno signatures. And then right, Elon Musk tells us we're going to have a million people on Mars in thirty years. The Martian atmosphere has no biosphere. There are no biosignatures, but it could be filled with techno signatures really soon from all of our exhaust. And then maybe, you know, we'll put an atmosphere of pollutants on the moon. And, you know, if you just dump all your stuff in the atmosphere of Mars or the moon, there are no ecological problems, right? There's no life that cares or you're going to, if anything, it'll warm Mars up, which is good for people. So, like, so the idea is that technology can spread. And you can have technology without biology. So in that sense, you know, and life can protect itself with, or technological life can protect itself. Like, you know, we're the first species that can prevent its own extinction. So there's no reason to think techno signatures would be short-lived 
In fact, there's good reason to think they might be extremely long-lived. And there's no reason to think that they would necessarily be on only a small fraction of planets' life. They could be on a thousand times as many planets as have life. And we just don't know. And so, no, I think it's, I think it's, there's a good chance that they're more common and we'll find them first. That's actually a really great point. I hadn't thought, appreciated that thought, Jason. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, well, this is brand new. We're writing a paper right now. <laughs> oh, great. Uh, so, well, thanks for sharing that really exciting result with uh, everyone here today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I was thinking, you know, it, you think of the normal Drake equation with, and you go number of planets that have life, number of planets that have advanced life or a fraction of those. But if your technologically advanced solution or civilization yes. populates N planets, then that factor becomes much larger. Uh, That's so right. It can compensate. It can compensate for if, if. That's right. If life is, if advanced life is rare compared to primordial right. life. So and you know, this, this isn't a new idea. This is the Fermi paradox. And yeah. the Fermi paradox is older than SETI. It was from the 50s. And the idea was if there's intelligent life out there, you know, it must be everywhere. It must be all over the place. And so that's one of the, you know, oldest scientific ideas about how common life could be, but uh, it's kind of gotten forgotten. <laughs> it's yeah, no, that's fair. I, yeah, 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 you kind of blew my mind there. Uh, so we have, we have uh, Dr. Weingartner on here to change topics a little bit. And he, I, I, he's a dust of astrophysics of dust expert. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, he was a former uh, student of Bruce Drain's. And, mm. and I imagine he is relieved to find out that Tabby's star, or Boyajian star, uh, is uh, um, has shows evidence of dust absorption uh, mm -hmm. when it does dim in brightness. So that that's exciting. Yeah. Um, so so at this point we have a couple of more questions, and I'm going to hand things over to our observatory TA and William Masco, who are live at the observatory. Uh, and um, Dr. Wright, if you could stay on for one more question and sure. then we'll uh, take it in a few minutes. Great. Great. Thank you so much for your talk. Again, let's have another round of virtual applause for our speaker. And Will, I will hand things over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Peter. And thank you, Dr. Wright, for the great talk. So we're going to go ahead and move to the uh, tour of our observatory and the night sky tonight. So let me go ahead and share my screen with you all. All right. So right now, we are connected to one of the computers in the observatory control room. I'm connected to it uh, with my laptop. And this makes for very easy remote viewing. Uh, I can control the telescope from the comfort of my own home. So it's very convenient. And one of the things that makes uh, that remote viewing possible is that we have a set of web cams on the roof that let us monitor the uh, conditions uh, and make sure that the telescope is uh, pointing how we think it should be pointing. And if you take a look, uh, we have three views. So on the top right, we have us. Hi. So uh, Dr. Parks is on my right. And of course, I'm William. So uh, usually we don't have people in here. So it's uh, uh, interesting to see warm bodies in this room. So we were performing some telescope maintenance earlier today, which is pretty much the only reason we were here. But anyways, this is where students uh, mostly sit and take data and operate the telescope when they're here in person. In the bottom left, we have an outside view of the telescope or the dome. And you can see we have the telescope uh, peeking through the shutter and we have a door frame for scale. So the door frame itself is about six and a half feet tall, and you can kind of get a sense of scale. You can see the little telescope peeking out, saying hi. And if we go to the last view, we can see the telescope itself. So right now, we are looking down the barrel, the optical tube of the telescope, and we see that we have this shiny, reflecty surface in the back, and that is the primary mirror. So this telescope is a 32 inch reflector telescope, 32 inches referring to the aperture of the telescope or the diameter of the primary mirror. So the way uh, light works in this telescope is it'll come in through the big opening, it will bounce off the back primary mirror, and then it'll come about two thirds of the way up the tube to this uh, strange little structure here, which is actually the secondary mirror. We are looking at the back of the secondary mirror and you can see the cross bracing supporting it. So light will bounce off of that secondary mirror and you can see we have this kind of black cylinder in the middle of the primary mirror. 
And that's a hole in the primary mirror where light will pass through, where it is yet again reflected off of a diagonal reflecting mirror into one of the four portholes uh, uh, on the back of the telescope where we have a variety of instruments, uh, including an eyepiece, a spectrograph, and a CCD camera. So at this point, what I want to do is ask Dr. Parks if we can point the telescope at one of the most interesting uh, astrophotography targets in the night sky, uh, the Orion Nebula. So while uh, Dr. Parks is taking us to the Orion Nebula, uh, I think we could ask uh, Peter to uh, ask that last question of Dr. Wright. Yeah, perfect. Um, and hopefully Dr. Wright is still with us if he didn't step away. Um, there he is. Okay, and we're watching the telescope slew right now. Our last question for Dr. Wright, and I might ask one more if something I want to, but it's been Cherry's privilege. Terry Smith asks, how far out in the galaxy, like 10 or 50 light years, would someone out there could detect um, uh, our, our Earth civilization? Right, this is, a, this is an interesting question. Um, this is also one that we've been working on. I have a student, PhD student, Sophia Sheikh, who's kind of leading the charge on this. Um, there's a lot of ways you might notice technology on Earth. It's all much less obvious, except in one way, uh, than life on Earth. And so it's an interesting question. If you were at Alpha Centauri, for instance, would you be able to tell Earth was there? Yes, probably, if you had our level of technology and really wanted to look hard. Uh, and then uh, could you tell Earth had life on it? That's much, much harder. Could you tell it had technology? I mean, if you look at a picture of the Earth from space, there's no obvious technology. There's stuff like you can see the Great Wall of China and this and that, but it's very subtle. Um, on the other hand, if you tuned a radio telescope, you would probably be able to pick up some of our most powerful signals. If, they, if we beamed them right at you uh, and you knew when to look and you knew what frequency to check, you would see a little blip from Alpha Centauri. Now, um, we have a new radio telescope we're developing uh, called the, the um, well, we're hoping to develop the, the square kilometer array in South Africa. And when it is fully deployed in, I don't know, quite a while, it'll be a while, they're in a precursor array right now. Um, it should have the sensitivity to detect our aircraft radar. And that's significant because that's on all the time. We're just shining aircraft radar at every airport in the world all the time. And that means we could detect our leak emission, not just a deliberate signal, but you might be able to detect life without, even, without anything special but a big telescope array from Alpha Centauri with something like that. So the answer is we could just barely detect ourselves at the nearest stars, the very nearest stars. Thank you, Dr. Wright. All right, so I'll turn it back over to Will. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wright, for joining us tonight. You're welcome to stick around. Uh, you're welcome to go take off if you need to. Uh, All right, I think I will. Um, it's, it's late, but uh, thank you for having me and uh, enjoy your tour of the sky. Have a good night, Dr. Wright. Thank you for joining us. Thanks. All right, and so I'll turn it back over to Will, and then Will, I have a question for you when you're ready. Okay, so uh, right now we're actually taking a very short exposure of the Orion Nebula. What you see now is actually the Crab Nebula uh, in H alpha, and we will talk about that more later tonight. Uh, but let's see uh, how the Orion Nebula looks. I have a sneaking suspicion we might want to uh, do maybe a redder filter with a longer exposure time. Just a suspicion. But we can see. Okay. Uh, All right. So uh, while we fire off another exposure, uh, let's say, yeah, H alpha 45 seconds. That'll probably do it. So I believe there was a question. So. Yeah, Will, so the question is uh, one we love getting um, during these events. What kind of optical design will the telescope be? Like a refractor, Dobsonian, or Cassegrain? You already mentioned that, uh, but uh, uh, let's make sure um, those on the audience uh, know what kind of telescope it is. Of course, yeah. So this type of telescope is a reflector telescope. So that just means it uses mirrors instead of lenses. The technical name for our telescope is a Ricci Cretion Cassegrain Reflector Telescope. Uh, a lot of technical terms there, but the main point is that we have mirrors that are slightly parabolic in shape. Uh, but as long as you understand that we use mirrors instead of lenses, I think you're in good shape. 
Great, thanks. So that means uh, we won't be able to take, detect space vampires, but maybe you could tell us about what we're looking at right now. So right now we're just having uh, an exposure coming in and we have a wonderful picture of the Orion Nebula. And we can actually have Dr. Parks, if he would like to talk to us about the Orion Nebula and say a few things. Sure, uh, hopefully you all can hear me. So the Orion Nebula is perhaps my favorite object in the night sky that isn't a planet, the sun, or the moon. One of the reasons for that is, uh, no, no, go back. Uh, yeah. Uh, so one of the reasons for that is when I was a child, uh, when I was walking to the, the bus stop, I would notice this particular constellation in the night sky, probably one of the few that people can, most people can recognize, and that is the Orion Nebula, or as I'd like to refer to them as Bob. You have the three stars in the belt, then you have a very prominent red star up here named uh, Betelgeuse, and then a very prominent blue star on the bottom called Rigel. Now in a very uh, night sky, and actually in an even mediocre um, bright kind of sky, you'll notice from the three stars uh, in the belt, if you go straight down, you'll notice essentially three more, which you really can't see here because of the because uh, the apertures are in the way, but essentially you'll see three stars that are pointed straight down from the belt, and that corresponds to Orion's sword. The center, or the center star, as it were, actually appears fuzzy. It's one of it's one of the few objects in the night sky that you can look at that isn't a star. That is actually more than a star. It's actually a nebula. And so, if you take an image of it you see something looks like this. How does it look on there? That looks a little strange, okay. Um, and there are a couple of interesting things to note about this. Let me see if I can do the star stretch. Oops, that's not what I wanna do. I am changing the contrast to, to point out a, a few different things. The other reason why I like the Andromeda, or excuse me, why I like the Orion Nebula so much is that the Orion Nebula is a star forming region. It is a place in the universe where stars are actively forming. And so those alien civilizations that Dr. Wright was talking about, I mean, those, uh, the planets where those civilizations might be, uh, might one day exist, are in the, pre uh, in the process of forming in this location. And a mere 1300 light years away, it's that's nothing in comparison to the amount of time it takes to build up a planet. So I like when I look through this, when I look at this object through the uh, telescope, I imagine, you know, I am literally looking at the creation of planets in this area. Now, in the very center of this nebulosity, you'll see four bright stars, and that's known as the trapezium. These are very, very bright, very, very hot stars. Uh, they are what we refer to as O and B type stars, They're roughly around 40,000 Kelvin in temperature. Uh, to give you an idea of scale, our sun is roughly around 6,000 Kelvin uh, surface temperature. So uh, at least uh, an order of magnitude hotter than our sun. Everything else you see around here that looks kind of like a cloud is the nebulosity. Hey, Rob, can you zoom in a bit? It's a little bit... Uh small on my screen. Sure. Well, actually, I was going to do this. That's not what I wanted to do. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, it's coming through great. And so the Andromeda Galaxy, or no, I keep saying Andromeda, the uh, Orion Nebula is a huge structure. And so uh, Will, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're the field of view of this image is what, 25 arc minutes? Yeah, about 25, 26 arc minutes. So oh, you answered one of the questions in the chat. Yes. So we got a couple of questions, but that was an answer to Daniel's question, the field of view. Perfect. So the field of view is roughly the same size as the full moon uh, to give you a sense of scale, uh, say on scale here. And so those four stars I showed you before, that's the reason why we can see this. That's the reason why we can see all of this gas, because essentially what's happening is that 
the energy and the light which are flowing out from those stars acts like a fluorescent light bulb. That light interacts with that primarily hydrogen gas and causes the, uh, that gas to become excited. And then when it de-excites, when it becomes, um, I guess, normal as it were, uh, it will shed off a lot of light uh, in many different, um, many different types of energies. And I don't know what just happened. I just disconnected. <laughs> I think I messed up the stretch too. There we go. Um, and so all of this gas. We, we got a question of what is a dark minute? Dark minute? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if that was asked. But um, all right, if that wasn't something you mentioned, we'll come back to that question later. No, not that I'm aware of. Um, but yeah, so oh, arc, arc minute. Arc minute. Minute. Arc, arc minute, arc minute. So an arc minute is a measure of angular distance. And so if you imagine the night sky as a sphere, as a celestial sphere, as it were, going all the way around it is 360 degrees. Going from one horizon to the other, that's 180 degrees. And then you can subdivide that into, uh, if you split that into 180 equal parts, that's that angle on the sky would be one degree. Uh, again, as reference, the full moon is essentially is half a or, um, half a degree on the uh, night sky. If you take a single degree and you split it into sixty equal parts, each of those parts is what we call an arc minute. And so the full moon would be thirty arc minutes across from one side to the other. And then finally, you get down to an arc second, which is if you take one of those slices, one of those um, one sixtieth of a degree, and you split that into 60 equal components, the width of that slice would be an arc second. Thank you, Dr. Parks. And Justin B., don't worry about it. I, uh, yeah, I, arc minute is kind of a weird term that astronomers use. And uh, it's it's uh, because we deal with such small angles, we, we don't want to say 0 0.003 degrees all the time. It just uh, we invent new words for things uh, to communicate precisely meaning. Um, so uh, we have another question for Dr. Parks. Uh, is the Orion Nebula a star or globular cluster or cluster? What, what, what is it? it uh, it's a good question. The Orion Nebula is a nebula, which generally speaking, is just a catch-all term for a cloud of gas. Uh, more specifically, it's a star-forming region, meaning that it is a region of, of space that is embedded within that gas. There is a certain amount of dust, which is that gas and dust is forming stars and also in turn forming planets. Great. Okay. And then um... We had another question about the field of view. They didn't uh, quite hear what was said about what the field of view is. Would you mind uh, repeating it again? Yeah, 26 arc minutes. So 26 arc minutes by 26 arc minutes on a side. Okay, and another question is, is that the proper name for the Orion Nebula? Does it have any other names? It's uh, also known as M42 or the 42nd object in Charles Messier's catalog. Uh, Charles Messier, so if you ever hear objects referred to as by M something like M42, which would be the Orion Nebula, M1 would be the Crab Nebula. These are objects which were first discovered by, or catalog really, by Charles Messier, a French, uh, French astronomer who really wanted to make his bones actually finding comets but kept finding things that were comet-like, but weren't comets. So he wrote all that down so that he would know if he ever came back to it, this is not what I'm looking for. So he kind of got famous for what he didn't want to get famous for. So you might say that Messier was looking for messy things on the sky. Ah, that's true. Okay. All right. So we've got a bunch of questions in the chat. Uh, one of which we covered earlier, and we'll come back to it a little bit later again when we take a look at the other side of the telescope. Um, so uh, another Orion-related, nebula-related question, though. Uh, how long does it take Orion Nebula light to reach Earth? I believe Orion. it said it was 13 light years away, I think, but that's, uh, that's, so that's what the person asked, and, and what's your answer? 
1,300 light years away. That's right. Yeah. So 1,300 years for light to go from, uh, roughly speaking, a star in the Orion Nebula to here. Great. Okay. Well, I think let's go ahead and move on to the, the next target. And then um, I'll ask another question while we're doing so. Uh, just to recap some of the things that were, were uh, gone over earlier, the aperture of the telescope is 32 inches in diameter. So the aperture refers to the diameter of the primary mirror, uh, which is about 0 0.8 meters or about 32 inches in imperial units. Um, and we have a, a question that was also answered earlier about the optical design of the telescope we are using tonight. And it's a Ritchie Cretion Cassegrain telescope, uh, which is a type of reflecting telescope. Uh, and then while we're um, saluting to the next target, we are bringing these images to you uh, and we're using a, a type of camera to do them, which, and maybe uh, either Will or, or Rob can, can take this question. Could you tell us what the CC camera used is to view this object and maybe some of what its properties are? And, and if you want, I could also help answer that too. Right. Okay. So great question. Yeah. So what is the imaging equipment we're even using in the first place? Well, we're using what's called a CCD or a charged couple device, and it's basically a fancy DSLR camera. So you can actually kind of, eh, not very well, it's kind of obscured, uh, but it's there. It's on the back of the telescope. Uh, we might get a better view of it later tonight, but it's basically just a very fancy camera and it has a shutter and that shutter can open, it can close and you can keep the shutter open for a certain amount of time. And when you eat, or when you have that shutter open longer, it will collect more and more light, enabling you to see fainter objects. So- Are you, are you hungry, Will? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think so. So- you, You've been at the telescope a long time tonight, so we appreciate uh, you uh, uh, missing dinner tonight. But just so you everyone know that, uh, Will and, and Dr. Parks have, have been out there since 3 p.m. to make sure to bring you these views tonight. It's, they make it look easy. Go ahead. We'll get you some food <laughs> after the show. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. So uh, as I was saying, uh, the CCD uh, is just a fancy camera. And it's a, in particular, it's a 4096 by 4096 pixel array. So there are 4096 pixels on one side, 4096 pixels. Uh, on the other side, it forms a giant square, and it's about uh, 17 million pixels or 17 megapixels, which nowadays isn't all that impressive, but it's still pretty good. So we can take reasonably high res images with it. But Dude, the this... wait, hold on a second. That's going to go away. Real quick now. Wow, what is, is that? You did a special stretch on Orion? But, yeah. Oh my gosh, that's beautiful, Rob. Yeah. You got to um, teach me that trick. Uh, well, there. There's we'll the see Orion Nebula on, uh, with the special time. mapping of the brightnesses to uh, to intensity. Oh boy, we need to do that ne next time. All right. Uh, okay. Well, wow. Sorry to interrupt, Will. I just what are we looking at now? So yeah, uh, we can come back to the CCD question uh, a little later as well. Um, so right now, Rob Parks is just fiddling a little bit with the stretch through the mapping. Uh, so. Basically what we're actually detecting here are photons of light and those photons of light will dislodge some electrons and the sensor will actually count those electrons and interpret that as some brightness. So we're looking at this in black and white because this camera doesn't really know how to see color. But what we're actually looking here is something called the Horsehead Nebula. So similar to the Orion Nebula, this is also an this is also a nebula, except it's a little different. Instead of you know being all bright and glowy and whatnot, this is actually dark. This is a darker nebula, and the I guess class of nebula is called a dark nebula. So what's actually going on there? Well, you can see that uh, down the middle we have this kind of uh, divide, uh, so to speak. So over here we have something that's a little darker, and then over here we have something that's a bit brighter. So if we could actually see this in color, and in fact, if you Google the Horsehead uh, Nebula, what you're actually going to find is that over on this side, uh, or you can actually see it here in the bottom image here, uh, this part uh, will be colored a very bright pink or red or whatever kind of uh, coloring you really want to put there. 
But that is a bunch of hydrogen gas being illuminated by a nearby star. So what's actually going on with this blob? Why is this bit not illuminated? Well, that's actually because in this particular region, you have a very, very, very thick amount of dust that is absorbing all of the light that would otherwise get through. So what you're seeing here is just a bunch of gas that is essentially absorbing all of this light and making this indentation in the gas cloud. So that is the Horsehead Nebula in a nutshell. So uh, for those who are interested, it's about 1400 light years away from us. And it was also first noticed in the late 1800s. So unlike the Orion Nebula, I don't believe this is something you're gonna see. This is definitely not something you're gonna see with your naked eye. So it's uh, quite small, but it's also a very popular amateur astronomy target as well, but uh, it's a little hard to find. So that is the Horsehead Nebula. It is an Orion. So the Horsehead Nebula is in the Orion constellation. It's not terribly far from the Orion Nebula. Yeah, in fact, the, the entire Orion constellation hides an entire star forming region. You can kind of see it. Uh, in the sky X there, you can see the band of the Milky Way uh, just running above Orion. And Orion's in the constellation of an arm, a spiral arm of our galaxy. And if you, if you had infrared eyes and could see the universe in infrared light, you would see that that infrared light it glows through the entire constellation of Orion, a site of, for the formation of tens of thousands of newborn stars. And it just so happens that the places we're looking like the, the Horsehead Nebula and the trapezium that we saw earlier are just the brightest um, in the visible wavelengths, but at other wavelengths, the rest of the night sky will glow quite differently. Okay, so we can go ahead and move on to the next target. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to post them in the chat. All right. So uh, while we're uh, waiting uh, to look at the next target, so we can see the telescope uh, moving yet again, but if we actually minimize uh, the night owls and we just take a look at the software that we have, uh, we can actually see uh, how we've been controlling the telescope. So it's uh, very simple, very easy. It's very much a point and click kind of thing. We can literally click on one of these targets and go to it. So what we're seeing here, this big uh, projection on the right, part of the screen is a virtual view of the night sky as it appears from Fairfax. So this is uh, just displaying all of the targets that are uh, visible to us. And we can literally just click on one and slew to it uh, if we can pick it out. If we can't pick it out, then we can just type in its name. So, uh, if you want to learn more about how to use uh, the software and all that stuff, I encourage you to sign up for Astronomy 124. Nice plug. <laughs> all right, so uh, we can see, I think uh, the telescope has slewed, so we can go ahead and take an exposure in H alpha. I think H alpha was better than red, wasn't it? It was, but I was, gonna, well, we have a safe image of that, but we can do H alpha. Okay. Yeah, let's take one live and see uh, what we get. So. We'll go ahead, uh, take a three minute exposure in H alpha. So we're gonna be looking at the Crab Nebula and I'll talk more about that when we actually get the image. Uh, it'll be our last image that we'll be looking at tonight. And uh, in the meantime, uh, we have about three minutes to burn. So if there are any questions, uh, I can take those. Uh, otherwise we can uh, uh, gas, bask in the beauty of the Horsehead Nebula. Okay, so we're taking another exposure of the horse head? Uh, no, we're doing the Crab Nebula right now. Oh, the Crab Nebula. Okay. Do you want to talk a little bit about the CCD um, and maybe like how it's similar and how it's different to the, you know, the things we use to take selfies? Okay. So um, with the CCD, I, uh, the main difference uh, with, with that and uh, what we have in our phones is that we have to cool down the CCD. So the reason for that is we have a lot of uh, noise uh, in the camera. So the, electron, the electronics themselves make heat 
and that heat is actually going to interfere with our measurements. So that's just having to do with how the CCD works. So when a photon comes in uh, from our telescope and goes into the CCD, it will knock out an electron of some kind of uh, silica substrate or whatever. And that electron gets read by the machine. But other stuff besides photons can knock out those electrons. In particular, if our CCD is very hot, then the ambient heat can dislodge some of those electrons and it can get read. So, and the CCD will re read them. So that's kind of why you see uh, this grainy kind of background. That's something called uh, the dark current that's running through the CCD. And so to minimize that, uh, what we can try and do is cool down the CCD to a low temperature. So right now, the CCD is at a set point of minus 30. And tonight, uh, we can get there. Uh, even though it was fairly warm out today, uh, we can get to minus 30 without much difficulty. So cooling down the CCD will, of course, make the ambient heat uh, a lot less. And it will reduce the dark current. So uh, if we didn't cool it down, this image would look a heck of a lot more grainier than it does. So I'd say the cooling factor is probably the main difference in uh, what uh, our CCD does and what you know something your phone does. Uh, I don't know if you want to add anything. Uh, yeah, you know, I'll just say um, it's uh, the other thing is that the pixels are bigger. So the typical picture pixel in a cell phone camera is about one micron on the side, and that's why it crams twelve megapixels, you know, in such a tiny little millimeter sized. Uh, device, but uh, this this digital camera is about that big. It's a, a little over an inch in diameter, and each pixel is nine microns on the side, making a bigger light bucket to collect more light. And while we're waiting for the um, next exposure to finish, I'll just ask um, or answer a couple other questions that have come in. Uh, we asked, uh, "What is the name of the object we were looking at?" Uh, we were looking at the. Um, thank you for the comment, Pankaj, and uh, looking forward to seeing you next uh, Wednesday as well. Um, we had a look at um, the Orion Nebula tonight, the Horsehead Nebula tonight, and now, what are we looking at now? So right now, we are looking at the Crab Nebula, trying to get a good stretch on it. Uh, I think medium, actually, might have been. Mm -hmm. So right now, uh, this is the Crab Nebula, and if we zoom in on this, and we can maybe center that a little. So we see we have this fantastic structure. It's, it's all spiky and has lots of bright spots and then dips. It looks like a giant mess, kind of like something maybe spilled uh, in the sky. And that is no accident. So this is actually a supernova remnant. So a star exploded and left uh, this kind of uh, trail behind. So this particular, whoops, what happened there? No, it's messing with the screen. Okay. Just keep All right. So uh, like I said, supernova remnant. So this particular one is about 6,500 light years away. And this supernova was actually recorded by uh, astronomers. They were Chinese astronomers in the year 1054. So what's fantastic is that when they were alive and they saw this explosion go off, it was dazzling. It was super, super bright. It would have been as bright as the moon and visible during the daytime. If you can imagine having something like that hanging around for a few months, that would be amazing. So this uh, thing, uh, this crab nebula, uh, resulted from a core collapse supernova, which is basically a very massive star, uh, about uh, 10 solar masses uh, or more, uh, basically just got to the end of its life and as it was running out of fuel and uh, building up iron, it basically just shut off and the star fell in on itself and resulted in a very massive, very giant explosion. And one thing, I'm not sure if you can see it in this image, uh, probably not, but uh, the thing that was left behind at the core of this supernovae was a neutron star or a pulsar. So pulsars are just very rapidly spinning neutron stars that emit electromagnetic radiation. 
So you can think of it kind of like a lighthouse. Uh, you have this strobing object that is spinning really, really, really fast, beaming radiation towards us at regular intervals. So I think uh, some of these rose, uh, neutron stars can rotate as fast as about 30 times a second. So that creates this regular pulse. And when we first noticed these, we first found these regular pulsating things out in space, we were really puzzled. We had no idea what they were. And we were wondering, oh, hey, are these alien signals? How can something be this regular, this timed? Are there aliens trying to contact us? And it was you know, eventually discovered that, no, it's not aliens. It's just pulsars. But still, it's a very uh, interesting, very strange uh, phenomena. So that is the Crab Nebula. And it looks uh, absolutely stunning tonight. So. This is a very great view of the Crab Nebula. I don't know if you want to add anything, Peter or Dr. Parks. That's well, a beautiful image tonight. Um, uh, go ahead, Dr. Parks. Oh, I was going to say a couple of things uh, uh, that I like about the, the Crab Nebula is, so you're talking about neutron star. Neutron star is exceedingly dense because it is, ex is basically the half the mass of the sun compacted down to something with a diameter of about three kilometers. So the the pulsar at the core of this uh, nebula is roughly three times the size of campus and it's spinning 30 times a second. If you can imagine that, to me, it's just mind blowing. And that's actually kind of a slow pulsar um, in terms of how pulsars go. The other thing I love about this object is that we've been, we've obviously since we've known about it since, you know, 1000 AD or whatever, We've been taking pictures of it pretty much since we've been able to actually take pictures of anything. And what I like is that this gas is expanding at a rate of hundreds of kilometers per second. And we have such a baseline at this point from the uh, earliest uh, Palomar plates that you can compare the image of the Crab Nebula back from, say, the 1950s to today. And you can literally see it's expanding. You can literally see that this thing is moving in time, which is one of the few things you can uh, that I could say about anything in, in space that you can actually see it evolve over our own lifetimes. Normally, astrophysical phenomenon are on time scales that are vast, millions of years. But the expansion of this is, is actually quite noticeable over only about 50 years. Great, and so we have two questions now, and I'm going to take them in reverse order. So the person that asked the question a while ago, um, uh, Isabella, just uh, bear with us. Uh, it's an exciting question, so we'll come back to it. Um, uh, but the second question we'll take right now is, what is the size limit for supergiant stars that go supernova to become a pulsar star to then become a black hole? Ah, okay. So the size of stars uh, to become a black hole, well, the only the most massive stars will collapse into a black hole. So I believe uh, the around the mass of 40-ish times uh, of our sun is higher, a lot higher. Okay. So in excess of 40 times uh, the mass of our sun. Around 150. 150. Oh, I didn't realize it was actually that much. So yeah, so very massive stars. Uh, well, that that's the maximum. Yeah, that's the that's the top end. Yeah. Here, anyway, the go minimum? ahead. Well, oh, the minimum. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, minimum for for turning into a neutron star. Black hole. Black hole. Was it around twenty? Is yeah. it twenty five? Yeah. yeah. And then uh, supernova is eight. Yeah, supernova is eight. Yeah. Sorry, I misunderstood the question. <laughs> that's okay. Yes, yeah, so uh, it's uh, somewhat rare for stars to directly uh, collapse into a black hole. So it's only true for uh, uh, some of the most massive of stars. So other yeah, th stars thankfully, those are also the rarest of stars. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, you don't want to have uh, stellar black holes popping up all over the place. That maybe wouldn't be the best idea. So the other stellar remnants are either neutron stars, which Dr. Parks talked about, or white dwarfs, uh, which are uh, another type of stellar remnants, actually uh, what our sun is going to become. 
So it's uh, a white dwarf is just still a very dense and compact uh, ball of matter. I believe it's made of carbon and other elements, carbon and oxygen, yeah. And it's not quite as dense and compact as a neutron star, but it's still very, very dense and very, very compact. So yeah, that's uh, stellar remnants in a nutshell, black holes, neutron stars, and white dwarfs. All right, so the, so the last question of the night, what are we looking at here, by the way, side by side before I, I take the last question? Uh, these are the same object, hold on. These are the same object taken through two different filters. Uh, the one on the left is taken through the green filter. So it corresponds most likely to what you would see if you were looking at this naked eye. And then on the right, is the H alpha filter. And so this is what you would look, uh, what you would be able to look like if you were able to put on goggles that were specifically designed to only filter out all light, but light from hydrogen. And so you can see that there is a lot of structure in terms of the hydrogen gas in this, uh, in this nebula that you wouldn't be able to ordinarily pick out if you were able to just look at it, say, through your um, with your naked eye. And so this illustrates one of the, the powers of a CCD camera. I know monochrome probably isn't the most exciting thing in the universe, but it is a powerful tool that astronomers can you know, use by being able to isolate what type of light they look at in order to determine uh, different types of phenomenon that, they might, that might be happening, what types of gas that might be uh, going around a star, or what the temperature of that gas is, and that sort of thing. Well, that is just a wonderful comparison side by side. We've never done that before. Yeah, so if you want to uh, zoom in on those even one more stage, it'd be really cool to get a, another side by side look. Yeah, so our last question of tonight kind of ties everything together and even kind of relates to what we're seeing here on the screen tonight. So our, our last question is, have you ever seen something odd while viewing stars? And, and I'll, I'll lead into that question uh, as I turn it over to Will and, and just and just uh, mention this idea that, you know, this was something odd, pulsars. I mean, Will, you could talk a little bit about the history of the discovery of pulsars and, um, and how it relates to tonight's talk on SETI. And then I'll, I'll, we could talk a little bit about some other things we see in the night sky that are odd. Right, well, uh... Yeah, there's certainly a lot of uh, strange things in the sky. So uh, pulsars uh, are one of them. And um, to be honest, I actually don't uh, recall the history of pulsars. Okay, yeah. Off the top yeah. Of my head. So, so Dr. Parks, yeah. LGM, uh, discovery oh, of pulsars. Green, the Little Green Men story, I think. That's oh. I'm so, okay, all right, I'll do it. <laughs> I mean, I know, long night. I know that one of the first, um, uh, were the first planets, the first planet that was detected and confirmed was actually around a pulsar. Is that where you're going with this? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I know you two are probably quite hungry at this point. We're going to wrap up the show pretty soon <laughs> uh, for everyone that's still stuck around to listen to us blabber. But what well, what uh, happened uh, is that when radio astronomy was new, uh, some astronomers were looking, just surveying the sky, and they invented radio technology to take very fast radio snapshots in the night sky, and they found some objects that pulsed. Pulsed really fast, anywhere from once a second to a thousand times a second. And when the first one was discovered, they called it LGM-1. They didn't know what it was, and they nicknamed it Little Green Men mm -hmm. okay. after aliens, because we'd never seen anything in our universe that pulsed so regularly, like perfect clockwork, so precise that you could set your watch to it as these LGM objects that they had started discovering with um, radio telescopes. And I mean, these are so precise, as Dr. Park said, you could actually use the timing of the pulses to detect the gravitational influence of plants as small as Mars orbiting them. 
Uh, but today we know them as pulsars, the remnants of supernova explosions, something that we didn't even know existed 80 years ago. Uh, and now, of course, there are a whole class of objects of just fascinating importance in astrophysics. But it does relate to um, this idea that we had in tonight's talk about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And that, you know, it's, it's you know, maybe it was aliens, right? So aliens doesn't necessarily have to be uh, the, the right answer. And maybe someday we will find them. Uh, but uh, it, uh, in this particular case, the discovery of pulsars, there was a, a non-natural explanation that seemed to make sense but turned out to have a perfectly natural explanation. And in fact, taught us about things about nature that we just hadn't known before. Uh, and to, uh, to riff on the question of weird stuff that we see in the night sky, there was actually uh, something that made the, I think it made the Twitterverse. I mean, it, was, it was among astronomers, we were talking all about it. And uh, briefly, uh, we had thought that we had discovered a um, afterglow of what's called a gamma ray burst uh, in the most distant galaxy that's ever been seen before going all and because when you look further away in space you're looking back in time because it takes longer and longer for that light to reach us if we look at galaxies billions of light years away that means we're seeing them uh, billions of years ago when our universe was much younger. And so there's this group of astronomers that published a paper of a gamma ray burst at a redshift of 11. You don't need to know what that means, but it's basically when our universe was very young. And so this is a galaxy that was very far away. Well, just two days ago, and it's, it's on Twitter, someone realized that at the moment that telescope was collecting that data, something more terrestrial happened to be going on. An earthbound satellite happened to be passing right in front of that galaxy at that time that observation was collected. And so there's a belief now that that wasn't a gamma ray burst at all, um, but was in fact a satellite um, passing through the field of view uh, and causing the quick blip uh, in brightness, ouch. So, um, human interference in the night sky is increasing and impacting the process of scientific discovery as uh, as seen just in this last week. Uh, and as companies like SpaceX and other companies are planning to launch um, tens of thousands of communication satellites for low latency internet, while it does serve many great purposes and SpaceX has done many wonderful things in terms of lowering the cost of access to space, you may have seen in the news tonight uh, the the successful initial landing of um, the uh, you're googling right now. <laughs> yeah. uh, you may have seen the successful um, landing of the the the, um, the uh, thank you for bringing it up of the Starlink. Uh, what's it called? SN10. They're building. Uh, Elon Musk is building the next generation uh, reusable rocket for going to Mars and things like that. But the, the truth is that you know, SpaceX has quite a complex um, history. And here's an example image of, of, of a night sky taken with a wide field survey showing many, many full moons of the sky. And these are satellites from um, SpaceX streaking through the field of view, essentially ruining this image uh, for astronomers after spending, uh, in the case of the uh, Vera Rubin telescope, which will come on sky, the next couple of years, something that taxpayers in the US have spent a billion dollars on, and we're letting a billionaire ruin that um, taxpayer investment. So, um, so light pollution is a major concern and increasingly, yes, even with our campus telescope, we do get a lot of satellites passing through the field of view. Uh, it hasn't been as much of a problem over the past year, but we are close to Dulles International Airport and Reagan International Airport, and we do get, um, planes passing through the field of view every now and then as well. Uh, but it is interesting to note, and you see some stuff in the news about UFOs being seen by military craft, uh, unidentified flying objects that do not have explanations as of yet. And there was a law passed an outgoing Trump administration to re release all classified information on UFOs in the next 180 days. And that, that'll be interesting to see what's there. Uh, and and uh, I'm certainly curious what they have to say, but certainly astronomers have been looking in the night sky for a long time. And um, Oumuamua is an example of something that 
has some aspects to it that are unexplained. And there are a lot of things in our universe that we don't know the answer to. And uh, there's a Occam's razor that the simplest explanation is, is most likely to be correct. And, and maybe someday we will find evidence of aliens or intelligent civilizations or even primordial life around other stars, hopefully even within, my, within our lifetimes. Uh, and it's a pretty unique time that we're alive that we have the technology to start answering these questions potentially uh, within our lifetimes. But uh, for scientists, at least for me personally, I'm happy that with the answer, of, we don't know right now, but we're trying to find out. And uh, until then, we're going to keep trying, we're going to keep looking. And when we find it, you'll know. I think it'll be hard to keep that a secret. Uh, okay. Well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Keep looking up at the clear skies. It's been a beautiful week in Fairfax, Virginia to go out and look at the night sky. And we'll see you all in four weeks for our next public evening under the stars lecture. And in two weeks for our Smithsonian lecture uh, uh, with uh, Dr. Mike Summers on the future of humanity in space. Now for that event, tickets are required and you can find more information on the Smithsonian Associates website. Just search Smithsonian Associates uh, uh, Space events with George Mason. Or you can email us if, you, if you'd like more information. Have a good night, everyone, and we will see you next time. All right. Thanks for joining yeah. us. Thank you. Thank you.